welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. And it's a bit of a mixed bag of gaming this week, isn't it, Hex? Yeah, a bit of a bit of a mixed bag of lollies full of milk bottles and those false teeth and the mint leaves that no one ever yeah. wanted. Anyway, Sly Cooper is back in Thieves in Time. And now I had a lot of explaining to do. And Path of Exile takes us into a dark and dangerous wilderness. The very sand shivers with malice. What have you started? What have you started? I need more mana. But first, can you guess the game for this week? Hmm? Now, before I go read the news, nearly the entire Good Game office has been sucked back into the perilous realm of DayZ of late after discovering how different this game is now that you can lose zombies by breaking the line of sight with them. Also, how much faster it is when you play on a server with vehicles. <laughs> hey guys, hello. hello. We're sitting down for a tea party. Ah, don't break! Go, go! Hey Jack. Oh my god! <laughs> oh wow. And <laughs> I love playing on these modified servers, Hex, not only because it speeds everything up a little bit, but also because it feels more like just a few days after the apocalypse as opposed to a few months on. In all of my probably hundreds of hours of vanilla Daisy, Hex, I've only ever found one vehicle and it was a rickety old bike. Your mind is attracting a lot of zombies. And to be fair, Goose actually found it and I stole it from him. <laughs> Bye, Goose! Alright, go. I'll be fine. Thanks! Ah, ah. Oh no! But still, that bike and its speed was mind blowing. And that's because in DayZ, normal things are amazing. <laughs> yeah, we've all been playing on a few different vehicle servers. He's trying to shoot my car! Mostly BHR clans, which has way, hundreds of vehicles and, more importantly, choppers. I love that we're doing this in a lightning storm. It's almost Close surreal flying after walking and crawling for so long in this game. How's it going? These the helicopters are, are pretty straightforward to, to fly. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear. Well, <laughs> relatively. I mean, one false move and you'll crash or eject or worse, but, you know. Oh dear. We are going down. We are going down. <laughs> Echo Charlie. Oh! <laughs> My beautiful, beautiful gear! I call it a panic crash, <laughs> where something happens and you just go like this with the mouth, whoa, and then down here upside down and it's all over. No, take it off, someone's shooting me. That was too long, we spent too long. Oh. Oh! <laughs> Ejects! Oh my god! Ejects! I love the strategy that helicopters bring to the game though, because if you need to pick someone up, you have to plan it perfectly. You have to find a safe spot, get in, get out, because if you're there just for a minute too long, someone will come and attack your flying bullseye. Do you guys think we can get under this refinery thing? No, I do not. Let's try it. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. I never doubted you for a second. This map also has lots of additional barracks and weapons all over the shop, but it's balanced somewhat by making them really hard to reach without a fight. Oh, it's bandit! Run! Get him! I just love that even though so much of this game is still so broken and wonky... Are you on the ground? I'm a bird. And it's still so hard to get into a server. Still, we're getting amazing stories out of this game. We push through all of that just because it is such a unique game. You gonna, gonna go check out that chopper zombie? Such is the journey of my bike with flames, which I called Vengeance 2.0. I was so happy to find this bike, heck, zipping through zombies with ease, exploring the countryside. Just me in the open road, got it going on. But then... Dangerous. Oh no! A fatal accident where another car and I swerved in the same direction to avoid each other and it just, it ended in real flames and violence. Oh, I think I got him! It is possible that whole exchange was just an accident, but in Daisy, shoot first, beans later. I still can't believe you managed to take that guy out in the heat of all that. I know, I just put it down to lag, probably, more than my <laughs> own accuracy. <laughs> I think these modified servers and the new maps will act as a nice stopgap for those who are a little bit impatient for the standalone game. Mm. Why is it taking so long, Hex? <laughs> Why? But props to BHR Clan for maintaining the server and rebooting it all the time to keep away hackers and bugs. Now, Hex, off you go to the news. It's all right. While I dream about sitting on the top of Electro in a ghillie suit with the DMR. 
Riot Games, the developer behind the popular MOBA game League of Legends, has opened a new studio in Sydney. Officially known as Riot Games Sydney, the new studio consists of several teams focusing on marketing, esports, and the community. League of Legends is officially the most played game in the world, with 12 million unique players per day, logging over a billion hours of playtime each month. Valve Software's Gabe Newell has become the latest gaming icon to be awarded a BAFTA Fellowship. The fellowship is the highest honour the Academy can bestow and recognises an outstanding achievement in the art forms of the moving image. Newell is now the fifth video game designer to be awarded the honour, joining Peter Molyneux, Shigeru Miyamoto, Nolan Bushnell and Will Wright. And at the BAFTA Video Game Awards, Journey was a big winner with five awards – Best Online Multiplayer, Artistic Achievement, Audio Achievement, Original Music and Game Design. Danny Wallace beat out Nolan North to win Best Performer for his narration in Thomas Was Alone. iOS Puzzler The Room claimed Best British Game. Telltale's The Walking Dead took out the Best Mobile and Best Story Awards, whilst The Unfinished Swan won Game Innovation and Debut Game. Far Cry 3 took out Best Action, XCOM Enemy Unknown picked up Best Strategy, and the top gong of Best Game went to Dishonored. Congratulations to all the winners. Good game. Sly Cooper has been missing in action since 2005, but he's finally back with his new game, Thieves in Time. And part of the reason for this long gap between drinks is because the studio behind the original Sly games have been busy with the infamous franchise. So the baton was passed to the new studio, Sanzura Games, and their new sequel sees the gang using a time machine to hop through history in what is one of the most varied platformers we've seen. Hex, I don't remember much about the Sly Cooper games at all, and in the start of this one, Thieves in Time, I wasn't having much fun. Smashing boxes to collect coins has to be one of the most tired gameplay ideas ever. Plus, the platforming is pretty much on rails. Instead of just being able to jump and climb around organically, you have to look for sparkly parts of the background, then pressing the sneak button locks you onto them. Then, just as I started getting bored, they went back in time. Do not slow down, Murray! I never do! You gotta love those Back to the Future references. Uh, plus, once the game shifts time periods, the gameplay really shifts up a notch as well. Uh, the simple platforming really takes a backseat, and, and you're doing something different every few minutes, I found. When we got to Japan, it was obvious something was very wrong. The first time jump takes you to feudal Japan, and because of the future technology being used, you can take advantage of Sly's hacker sidekick, Bentley. The gang's beefcake character Mari also adds variety with his slower combat sequences, and his objectives are just as random. I was surprised to see this fishing minigame using the six axis part of the controller. I forgot that was even <laughs> in the controller. This is terrible. The perfect speckle cave nipper! And then this happened. Ah, yes, the old cross dressing geisha hippo rhythm minigame. Classic. Of course, you'll still be playing as Sly Cooper and his ancestor locals. These levels conform to the more typical stealth platforming, but Sly does get to use some samurai armor to slip past the guards and reflect fireballs. Then they time shifted to the Wild West. Looking for my ancestor, Tennessee Kid Cooper. The action sequences and the variety are both taken up a notch here. Sly gets tossed in jail, complete with a giant ball and chain, which they use in some really creative ways. Yes, and Sly's cowboy ancestor naturally packs a pistol as well. That person shooting's a pretty big departure from the normal Sly action, but they've done a good job here of pinching tricks like Red Dead Redemption's slow-mo marking targets. Plus, there are a few explosive sequences as you blast barrels and enemies while hurtling along railway tracks. I mean, you can't fault this game's variety. One of the criticisms I would level at the game, though, is that some of these sequences do overstay their welcome. Boss battles in particular are a bit of a grind. I mean, we know the drill. Learn the boss's attacks, wait for the moment of vulnerability, rush in and smack them around, then rinse, repeat. How do you like my cane style? But it's just so repetitive. And I can't say I made much sense of the game's plot, either. I mean, there's this art dealer criminal mastermind guy that's travelling through time stealing rare artefacts. But, I mean, realistically, if you had a time machine, wouldn't you just go back in time and get the winning lottery numbers and just save yourself a bunch of hard work? I think you might be overthinking it a little bit, Hex. Just 
Just go with it. Time travel always has holes. It's wibbly wobbly. Take when you're in the Ice Age, for example, and putting on a saber tooth coat and suddenly it lets you leap about like Wolverine. Or when your caveman Cooper ancestor has a sumo fight. I didn't ask why, I just went with the flow. Just went with it. Well, I would have liked to have seen some of the core platforming as slide just tightened up a bit because it was a little bit simplistic. But, mm. you know, I do agree there are some really enjoyable sequences here. Yeah, I can't remember the last platformer I played that had half as much variety as this. But I'm giving this seven and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Yeah, there's a lot of polish here, and this new developer has brought a lot of fresh ideas to the franchise, which often isn't the case, so I'm giving it eight. Good game! Somewhere beyond the sea lies a city. A city where the artist would not fear the censor, where the scientist would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small, and where the player could freely explore an unforgettable video game location saturated in style and literally dripping with atmosphere. Would you kindly join me in the city of Rapture? In what is arguably one of the most breathtaking location reveals of all time, we first set our eyes on the shimmering lights of this soaked city while plunging down to the depths in a tour-guided bathysphere. Peering out of the porthole gave us our first fisheye view of this sprawling sunken metropolis. Floating in between the Art Deco-inspired sea scrapers, interconnecting walkways and their neighbouring sea creatures felt like some sort of dream. A dream that quickly transformed to the stuff of nightmares once players finally stepped out to explore the city itself. Designed as a submerged utopia for brilliant minds and gifted souls, Rapture was created with nothing but good intentions by its architect, Andrew Ryan. An entrepreneur who rejected the social norm and believed that his version of 1950s society would benefit from some aquarium-inspired isolation. However, as both you and the entire population soon discovered, society would buckle under the constant pressures from above and eventually, Rapture broke down and tore itself apart. From there, players are left to explore this largely abandoned and drenched dystopia. Each area is littered with recordings that tell the story of Rapture's rise and fall, all covered in that sugar-coated optimism of the 50s. complete with an eerily juxtaposed soundtrack of happy-go-lucky tunes. The most unsettling feature of this city, though, was a constant feeling of claustrophobia brought on by an ever-present ocean outside, as it pushed its way through every gap and hairline fracture in the rusting and rotting architecture of the city, drowning out the light. Whatever surface light that did actually make it down this deep would only trickle through the windows and glass ceilings, painting everything in a dull aqua glow. Still, players took delight immersing themselves in this wild and waterlogged nightmare. In fact, we sank so many hours into the first adventure under the sea that a second trip to Rapture eventually let us soak up all the dank and daunting atmosphere we wanted in this moisture-ridden mausoleum. <laughs> The City of Rapture. Dive on, dive on, dive on. Good game. Thanks, Goose. All right, time to look at a couple of downloadable indie titles. First up, Kentucky Route Zero. This is an episodic point-and-click adventure, and so far this is just the first in five episodes. It's a mysterious and abstract little game. You play Conway, who, together with his dog, are trying to deliver... something and have to find the elusive highway known as the Zero. And in classic style, you click on bits of the world and walk over to them and interact with certain objects or people. But pretty soon, you get the sense that everyone and everything is just a little bit off. First of all, I love the art style and graphics here. They reminded me of Another World, and the soundtrack was nice and subtle. But I've got to say, after a while, this all felt like a lot of boring, artsy dribble. Everyone you meet just waffles on about who knows what. There's no puzzles. You just click on things, read some gibberish, and drive down the road to the next scene. To me, this is another one of those games that sits alongside the likes of Dear Esther or Proteus, both of which I actually really enjoyed playing with all their unconventional mechanics and moody feelings. 
games like this can feel like a refreshing breath of air as you work to interpret meaning from your strange encounters and just let your emotions guide you. That said, analysing subtexts and themes from a bare-bones amount of information and story can get old very quickly. With Kentucky Route Zero, there's a decent sense of mystery and it's got a very interesting vibe, all kind of like playing through someone's dream, so I was intrigued to find out what was actually going on. Unfortunately, by the end of the short episode, the payoff just wasn't there. There are times it reminded me of a good old text adventure which have a special spot in my heart, but it just lacks any meaningful input from you. For example, I liked all the dialogue options you get, but they're actually all pointless. Other than getting to name your dog, nothing you say really affects anything and no choice you make actually matters. When I finished the first episode, I had no idea what had just happened and didn't really feel like I'd done anything, which for me wasn't much fun. It's always hard to rate these arty games, but I was still intrigued by its strangeness and drawn in by its art. Plus, I am interested to see if things pick up a bit in the next episode. You got to But for now, I'm giving it a growing sense of unease and a vague wistfulness. Ooh. Okay, moving on to the brain-bending puzzler, The Bridge. The Bridge is pretty much the exact game that MC Escher and Isaac Newton would have created if they owned a small indie studio together. In fact, the game goes so far as to say that on its product page. As you start the game, you'll have to wake up your little character by rocking gravity from side to side until an apple falls on his head. Then, after a short walk, you find his house, filled with little rooms, each one containing some physically impossible level, which, to complete, you simply walk around and manipulate gravity to reach the exit door. There's a perfectly adjusted difficulty curve here as they gradually work to introduce new elements in each level, like the menace balls, gravity vortexes, and parallel dimensions while also easing you into some of the more complicated levels that just hurt my head looking at them. It is a very short game though. It only took me about an hour to complete and to be honest, I breezed through most of it. You can feel that the bridge has borrowed some of the best ideas from some of those classic indie games of the past. You can rewind time like in Braid, although Braid actually used time in a clever way and conveyed some meaning through its story, whereas I had no idea what they were on about here. Then there's the black and white style of Limbo and the gravity switching of And Yet It Moves, or the ghostly shadow you leave behind you when you die, like in Super Meat Boy replays. But it's just a shame that the game never manages to use any of these clever ideas to a greater effect. Visually, the game is a delight to look at and all the levels have been really cleverly designed. Everything is hand-drawn and the fact they've made these near impossible structures into actual levels is impressive just in itself. Again though, it all just felt a bit too short for the asking price. I know quality is always better than quantity, but here I couldn't help but feel a little bit shortchanged. There were a few nice little moments where I actually felt clever solving the puzzle, but most of the time it was just a matter of trial and error rather than actually figuring the solution out. While it does offer some very unique level design, it's just a shame they didn't take it any further, so I'm giving it six and a half. Ah, oh, worked it out. Here's everyone. <laughs> to turn down a dungeon crawler badge, Path of Exile is a click em up brought to us by New Zealand developer Grinding Gear Games. Their aim is to keep the game entirely free to play, funded only by ethical microtransactions. That is, the only items you can pay for are purely cosmetic and give no actual in-game advantage to the player. The game is currently in beta, so we thought we'd check it out, and since it's free, it's our first gratis gaming pick for the year. Someone wants to join the party. <laughs> I'm a machine. What have you got floating around you? What is that? That's my gotta go fast thing. When you see that, I gotta go fast. Wanna see it again? <laughs> I live yeah. a little bit more. With every death, I live a little bit more. Someone's firing at me. Oh, it's you! <laughs> you I'll just sonic boom them. Sonic boom them, please. Sonic boom! Sonic oh. boom! Oh, this guy! I an arrow which does poison. I love that these like zombie chicks, they, throw, they all throw rocks. Yeah, we may be zombies, but we know how to rock. Ew, gross. I was in a menu, so I didn't quite see it, but I came back and I was covered in blood. There are currently six playable character classes to choose from, each with their own tale of woe. I drank, and the next thing I know, I'm on this stinking crate bound for exile. For whatever reason, you've been exiled to a kind of Van Diemen's Land prison continent called Rayclass, a nightmarish land filled with all manner of ghastly beasts that you must battle to stay alive. 
On its surface, it may seem a lot like any other dungeon crawler out there, taking inspiration from games like Diablo and Torchlight, but a little way into the first area and you'll start to discover that there is a lot about Path of Exile that is striving for uniqueness. First of all, I love the look of it, Bajo. It's so nice to see something other than that kind of cartoony art style that other games like this tend to favour. Mm. Here, everything is dark and gritty with a really nice realism to it. Yeah, and even in the bleaker looking areas, they find ways to add touches of beauty to it with particle effects that catch the light or curls of mist and smoke. Another thing you'll notice is a bunch of players running around in the hub towns. Every area you enter outside of these towns works like an instance where only you and members of your party will be active. But these hub areas are such a great idea because it makes it that much easier to find randoms around your level to go adventuring with. Still alive, are we? Other aspects will seem familiar as well. Waypoints, portals, class-appropriate loot. But where other games have craftily played into our sense of greed... Oh, look at all that gold! Yeah, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it! Loot, loot, loot! Path of Exile offers no gold whatsoever. There is no actual currency in this game per se. Instead, you can trade items you don't need for useful things like portal scrolls, identify scrolls, and magical orbs, and vice versa. It doesn't completely revolutionise things, but it's a cool alternative and it's strangely liberating, really. Another way this game sets itself apart is that instead of learning active abilities, all additional attacks are governed by specific crystals that you'll pick up or earn as quest rewards that are then slotted into your armour and weapons. The crystals are colour-coded and require certain class attributes to wield their power. It's another really interesting and different way this game deals with combat. Yeah, it took me a while to get my head around it, but once I did, you really start to learn the value of those rarer items with lots of gem slots, because they determine how many gems you can have equipped and, and therefore how many fancy attacks you'll have at your disposal. My ranger had this cool poison ice fire thing going on with my arrows. It left these glittering clouds all over the battlefield. It was cool. I was also pleasantly surprised to see that your gems level up as you use them and combining them with other support gems which link to them will modify an ability's effect. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where I start to really nerd out over all the possible customization options and the gems that I can swap in and out and the linking. Gems! So you open the title. Gems, gems, gems. Gems, gems, gems. And if that sort of thing does it for you, just wait till you get to add your first passive skill point. Okay, here we go. Just gotta decide where to put my first... Holy crap, look at that skill tree! Yeah, it's crazy. It's not so much a skill tree as it is a skill forest. I think I spent the first five minutes just staring open-mouthed and gaping at this thing, just wondering how I was going to take it on. I mean, talk about daunting. But once you have put in a few points, you can start to see those familiar paths that you can take, so it does get a bit less stressful. <laughs> Everything is connected, and you can build and develop your character into any and all directions of the sprawling web that you desire. And it plays nicely into the class system as well. Choose wisely! Of the six classes, there are three main, a tank, a ranger, and a caster, and three hybrid classes as well that use combinations of strength, intelligence, and dexterity. For example, I love my ranger and my witch, but if I really wanted to be able to focus on mastering both spells and those quick, dexterous attacks, I probably would have been better off choosing the shadow. It's nice not being dead yet. The Marauder tanks with pure brute strength, but the Duelist uses both strength and dexterity if you'd rather play a fighter with a little less smash and a little more finesse. And you... Just a moment, I'm just dispatching these skellies with my bow. Just getting its face smashed. And I love that. I love a game that doesn't lock you in as long as you've got the relevant attributes to use something. And I love a game that breaks the rules a bit like this, Hex. Other great ideas is health and mana pots automatically regenerate as you get kills, and you can also upgrade your flasks with additional effects. It's great, isn't it? It's so clever because it means you can't just kite enemies around and wait for your health to refill. You actually have to work to get your health back. Exactly, but what's even better is that the game's difficulty is reflected in this system. I mean, you do need to pot often because the game is nicely challenging, and I know that was a, an issue you had with the first playthrough of Diablo 3. Yeah, Diablo 3 was super easy on normal, and this, I, I love that it can get out of hand really quickly. Another thing I think it does better than Diablo 3 is the randomly generated stuff. Because with Diablo, I felt like it, it, there was random stuff in there, but it still felt like only a couple of different set pieces that were randomised, and here I think it's much more, much more complex. Yeah, I'm not sure what was going on with those areas. It seemed to randomly change on me a lot more than other games like this that I've played. I think it might regenerate the instance each time you log back in or create a new party, but I swear sometimes I would just go through a door, then back through it again, only to find that everything had changed. What? 
Oh, this is trippy. Oh, maybe I'm just going crazy, I don't know. Yeah, it's a bit disorientating at times, isn't it? But that does keep you on your toes. Yeah, and it really helps with replayability because each run through an instance is always going to feel fresh. Yeah, I'm having a great time with this game, Hex. I did not expect it to be this good and I'm definitely coming back to it. Oh. That's awesome! Sonic Boom! And this is the kind of game that's already so well made and providing so much for free that you genuinely want to make purchases just to support the game. Yeah, you know they're doing free to play right when you actually want to give them money because you're getting enough value out of it already. Hmm. Uh, plus, it's nice hearing the familiar accent of our Kiwi brothers voicing these adventurers in a game and bucking the American trend. Hmm. They were right to fear me. If only they had listened to their cowardice. Was I supposed to bear such insults with an action simply because of his high birth? I feel him traveling beside me to this new land, this Rayclast. There isn't much to complain about here. I did notice a bit of lag which kind of makes up close and personal melee a little bit tricky at times, but this is only still in beta. However, we have kind of given it a full review hex, so if you were to give it a, a hypothetical score, what would you give it? Hypothetically? Yeah. If this was hypothetically a finished game, I'd mm. give it a, a hypothetical nine. I think I would also give it a hypothetical nine <laughs> out of ten rubber chickens. Hmm. So did you guess the game for this week? It was Rocket Robot on Wheels, released in 1999 for the N64. You controlled a singular wheeled robot and faced physics-based challenges. Mass, friction and inertia were all part of the gameplay. And it was the first game by Sucker Punch, the developers originally behind the Sly Cooper series. Ah. Hmm. Well, next week we build mighty cities and then destroy them with dinosaurs in SimCity. <laughs> Kratos returns, rage and all, in God of War Ascension. And in Spawn Point over on ABC3, we battle through the afterlife in Skulls of the Shogun. Till next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo, also out. All I can think about is lollies. I know, I was just about to say, I actually yeah. didn't mind mint leaves in the end. Yeah. You know why? Because I'd eat all the lollies first and leave the mint leaves, but then I'd get desperate and just eat the mint leaves anyway. And I think over time, conditioning, right. I just started to like them. Right. I just like them all. Do you though? What no. about black jelly beans? Black je like, we've been through this. I like black like jelly licorice beans. And licorice. licorice is great. Licorice is great. Demons. Licorice spawn. is great. Stealth heli. Good day.